All right, everybody, welcome to the final session for the Master Lease Option Workshop. This is session three. And although it says exit strategy, uh, if you remember from our previous session, we talked about negotiations. So we've skipped a couple of things along the way. Now, a lot of this, as you'll find out in the resources here in a minute, you can go to the, hold on one second, I got to kill the ding-dongs. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Sound is now dead for that. Good. Oh, I also need to pull that up and put this down here. Awesome. So in the last session, we talked about negotiations. So the things we've skipped have been um, closing on the deal, due diligence, finding property management, operating the property, things like that. And then you get into actually exiting the deal. So really our exit strategy should be front of mind before we even get into the opportunity. We should already know kind of where we want to be in an exit strategy. So as we're doing that due diligence, we're coming up with that exit strategy. So we're going to backtrack slightly before we actually exit the opportunity. And we're going to talk about a few things. The rest of it will be in the resources uh, section for you to watch as far as underwriting, things like that, interviewing property management companies, that's all over in the strategic partnering workshop. So before we get started, are there any questions about the first two sessions or about the homework that you had between last week and this week? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Well. Either I'm doing a really good job or you guys just don't want to ask questions. So let's get moving then. All right. So what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to talk about that business plan. How do we increase our NOI? Your business plan should always be about increasing the NOI. So we'll talk about how to do that through income from rents and other income. I mean, that's really our income. So we'll cover that. That'll be pretty brief. We pretty much know what to do there. Then we're going to talk about operating efficiencies um, and not necessarily lowering operating expenses because it's a little difficult to lower expenses. Most expenses are fixed. Other expenses are rising. They're not lowering. So we got to find operational efficiencies. So we can do that through management and we can do that through preventative maintenance. So that's what we're going to talk about in operating efficiencies. If you guys remember from when you first were introduced to me, I told you that I used to own a property management company. Probably one of the most important things I learned about operating multifamily properties was preventative maintenance. If you follow a preventative maintenance program, then your operating expenses can be lowered because you'll have less maintenance costs because things don't break as much because you're inspecting stuff on a more um, scheduled interview inter interval. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Then we'll get into exiting the deal. So now that you've operated it, now it's time to exit it. Well, first we're going to talk about exiting the master lease because we can exit the, actually we can exit the option at any time, but on an annual basis or however long you have negotiated the term of that lease, we can exit that lease at that point in time, whether we decide to purchase or not. So we'll talk about exiting the master lease without executing the option to purchase and exiting it with the execution of the option to purchase. Then we'll talk about exiting the option to purchase and we can um, do the same thing, whether we're going to buy it or whether we're not going to buy it and then uh, how we can get owner financing. And that will be the conclusion. We'll go over some homework and then have our final Q&A. So that's what we're going to cover today. So before we get started, let's just talk about some resources that you can go to to fill in some gaps that this workshop, because we only had three uh, sessions to teach it, the gaps that you can fill. Some of those gaps include due diligence. Now we're going to cover due diligence very, very, very briefly today because we're going to talk about some ways to 
uh, get through a closing when we're exiting the deal. So you can see some of that information in due diligence. But due diligence is in module eight of the strategic partnering workshop. So go to that for due diligence. That'll get you your checklists and your forms as well as what you need to look out for. And I'm going to give you an example or show you the checklist that I provide for you in the members area. We're going to kind of go briefly over that uh, when we get to that section today. Then hiring property management, because we're going to talk about operations a little bit today. Uh, module 11 in the strategic partnering workshop covers property management and it covers operations as well as how to hire a property management company. We're not going to be talking about how to hire a property management company. That is an entire lesson all by itself, a two-hour lesson. You can go watch that in module 11, and it comes with um, a questionnaire that we cover in great detail in that session. And then closing the deal. We are going to cover closing the deal a little bit today. It does get a bit more involved when you're uh, closing on a transaction that you're acquiring, not one you've been operating for the last three years. Um, so you can go to module 12 to learn about how to close the deal and uh, what are all the agreements needed for that. And you're gonna see some of those agreements because they're all listed in the due diligence checklist. That due diligence checklist is like none you've ever seen. I guarantee it. It, I guarantee it will be one of the most detailed checklists you've ever had. All right, so let's talk about the business plan. Well, we need to increase income. How do we do that? Well, we know how to do that. We've just got to raise rents, right? So how do we raise rents? Somebody tell me. What do we do to raise rents? Or how do we know what we can raise rents to? You, 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 you well... Well, that's two different questions, but I was going to say you can add benefits to the tenants to 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 raise uh, raise rents. You can do them as you turn the lease. Um, how but do how you, do you know how much the tenant can afford, Roger? Where do you get that you data? Do your market analysis and look at uh, what the uh, income uh, general income is in the uh, in the area that you're operating in, in the MSA that you're operating in. In the MSA or in the trade area. In the trade area, there you go. Right. So for those that may not know how to define a trade area, you can go to module four of the strategic partnering workshop and I explain that in great detail. That is the monster. If there's a monster within the... <coughs> if there is a monster within the monster, because the whole course is a monster... It is module four. It is the hardest course, the hardest part of the course by bar none because it's stuff you've never seen before and in tools you've never seen before, which is why I give you guys the opportunity to request the reports from me, but you need to know how to define your trade area in your market so you know what to ask for in the reports, okay? So if you ask for a report, I can tell whether you've seen module four or not just by the way you answer those questions, right? So you have to define your trade area, which is the neighborhood, basically a little bigger than the neighborhood. Define that trade area and figure out where your direct competition is and what that market rent is. But as we've seen in my videos over the last eight weeks on YouTube, things are trending downward. So don't just look at what it currently is right now and go with that number. You have to look at it and see where is it trending. So you want to look at a quarter over quarter spreadsheet like I provide for you in CoStar and identify where you think those rents are going or where they can go. And that's how you determine what that maximum rent can be. So when you're getting ready to negotiate on this opportunity and you've seen the rent roll, and you look and you say, okay, well, rents are $750 a month for these same type of units. CoStar is saying that they're $800 a month, but it's been trending down for the last two quarters. Is that an opportunity to raise rents? No. No. So that's why we need to pull that kind of information. Go ahead, Richard. Can't you also determine if the vacancy rate? 
if you're at 100% full and others aren't, can you uh, then say, oh, you know, maybe we can raise it, push the rent a little bit? Well, if you're 100% full, then it's because you are not at what the rest of the market is sitting at. But okay. don't rely on just being 100% full as I can raise rents. You need to know what you can raise rents to. It's part of that business plan. You've got to be able to plan where you can go with those rents. And that's why we got to look at those trends. I mean, chances are, yes, I, which what I look at, Northwest Arkansas yesterday, Class C properties in Northwest Arkansas are sitting at 97.8% occupancy. Holy crap. It, largest occupancy in the entire country we've seen yet. 45 properties, I think we've looked at. 40-something 40, 40 properties. And this was the largest occupancy we've seen for Class E properties. Northwest Arkansas was by far the best market. But you've got to look at the data. You wouldn't know that if you didn't look at the data. So you've got to request the data, look at the data, and that can tell you what you can take your rents to. Okay? Property management. What's that mean? Why do we include property management in income? Actually, that shouldn't say property management. Yes, it should. Property management. Why do we include, why did I include property management here? What's that mean? What's that mean? Well, they take care, they take care of the tenants and um, they also may determine what the rents are going to be. Well, correct. They, deter they can help you determine what the rents are. So you look at CoStar, look at your third-party data, and then also reach out to property management companies and see what they're doing. This will also help you when deciding how to, I got to move you guys, I keep looking, really I shouldn't be looking at you at all. That way I'm not looking way over here. They, it can help you uh, when hiring the property management company. If they come back and their data is really close to what you pulled in CoStar, or what I pulled for you in CoStar, um, they're giving you good information um, whether they can win the deal or not because some of these property management companies, when you reach out to them, they think, okay, well, if we help them, we can get the property management assignment. If they don't buy the property, we can't give them property man. We can't get a property management assignment. So we're going to give them overinflated information to help them purchase the property. So there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there when you're looking at property management to help you determine whether um, you have the right rent assumption or not. So verify it with the data that you're getting from your supply side source. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah, I know it's like when you hear somebody say, when you ask them, where did you get your rent comps from? And they say, oh, well, our property management company, or we had multiple property management companies let us know what the rents were in the market. There's a little bit of a conflict of interest there because especially if they say, that they had multiple management companies because they're all fighting for an assignment if they win the deal. Now, if they have an internal management company and they use them, then that's probably pretty good information, all right? So that's why property management is here. Is there anything else other than other income that we can include to improve our income uh, in the rent side that you guys can think of? Yeah, rent. Okay. So that said, let's talk about other income. So what can we do with other income? Remember, these are small properties. These aren't large properties. These are small properties. What can we do with other income to help improve the income situation to bring our NOI up? That's a question to you guys. Well, David, private parking, private parking, uh, where they can park in front of their door. Okay. It, so if, if there's no parking right. income, can we create parking income? I like that. What else? If the, if there's no, no washer dryers, if it's just hookups, you can put washer dryers in. Very good, Roger. Yep. Storage, Zorama. Good. Yeah. yeah. What about if you installed a rubs program? 
That's the one I'm looking for. It's coming from me next. <laughs> I thought I'd get that one first. So yeah, a ratio utility billing system doesn't have to be a rubs. Everybody calls it rubs. Um, that's an actual software program. Uh, you can just implement a flat fee. But if there are a situation, and it's probably going to be the case, because for whatever reason in the 1970s um, and 60s and 70s, the developers went to a master meter program. I don't know if costs for feasibility just skyrocketed during that time or, or what the problem was, but maybe they saw ways to cut costs because interest rates were so high during that time. I don't know, but they went to these master meter systems. And so a way we can get the tenant to pay for that is to do some kind of rubs, whether it's actually using the software and implementing it, which puts a little bit of onerous on the management company. Uh, I would definitely consider it if we had on-site management, but we're not going to have on-site management on most of these deals. So I really wouldn't probably use rubs unless the management company that you're using has already implemented it on other properties. I just go with some kind of flat fee system, which you've got to be careful with on that one is that you're not making any money on it because that's illegal in most states. I don't know if it's illegal in every state. I would assume it is, but it's just an assumption. I don't know that for sure. But I do know in the majority of states, you cannot make money when billing utilities back to the residents. Okay. So that's what I did. I used a flat fee. So 50 bucks a month flat fee. It was easy because the tenant could budget it. They knew what it was going to be every month and it was very easy for them to agree to. So I love the flat fee part of it. David? Yes, sir. On the uh, laundry portion, is the landlord buying the washer and dryer and renting it to the tenant? So there are ways you can do that, Richard. Um, if you have... Uh, washer and dryer connections, because a lot of times you won't have connections in these older buildings. If the connections are there, then you can either lease or purchase the washer and dryers. I would recommend, because I know residents and I've seen what residents do in apartments, that you lease the washer and dryers because then you're not responsible for the maintenance of them. When you do that, you just have to do your rental increase high enough that it covers the lease amount to the vendor on top of making a little bit of money, okay? So you don't make a whole lot of money, but you can make a little bit of money when it comes to washers and dryers. If the property does not have connections, it is not cheap to install connections. So it's gonna require permits, it's going to require open walls, plumbing ran, electric ran, more than likely 220. You're going to have to cut holes through the exterior of the building to run vents so, uh, through multiple walls. So where you may think it doesn't cost a lot to add washer-dryer connections, it actually costs an incredible amount to run washer-dryer connections. Um, I had a owner that, or it was a client, the one that purchased the 144 units from me in Pensacola, they were adding washer and dryer connections to those proper, to those units. And he was telling me that it was running them about $2,500 a unit to do it. They're not cheap. So be aware of that if that is a plan that you want to move forward with, okay? There's a huge capital expense to it. Yeah, it'll take a long time to make that up too. Yeah, well, and your, your unit's going to be down for a while, too, because you've got to pull permits. Um, so you've got inspections to deal with, inspectors, uh, vendors, contractors, all kinds of people. That unit can be down for three months wow. just doing this upgrade. So you're losing income, and it's got this huge cost to it. So make sure you do a cost-benefit analysis to make sure that that is actually going to work or not. It would probably be easier... If there's a laundry room to 
uh, make the laundry room more efficient than it would be to build washer and dryer connections. Mm -hmm. Now it made sense on this 144 unit because where, where it was located and the type of residence that he was going after, he did the cost benefit analysis on it and he won. He did really good with it. All right. So we also have parking. Parking was mentioned. Storage was mentioned. Uh, washer and dryer connections were mentioned. Uh, a laundry room, if you have one. And then uh, concierge service. So what what do I mean by concierge? What's the number one concierge service? There's two big types, but what what are what are they? Do you guys know? Well, garbage. Garbage is one. What's the other one? If you have on-site management, you're not going to have on-site management on these properties. If you had on-site management, you can do concierge services for packages as well. Okay. Everybody buys on Amazon these days. Most people are even buying their groceries now. They're not even going to the grocery store anymore. So my wife started doing that this morning. She was looking for something, went to walmart.com and ordered her grocery list that she was doing on walmart.com. And she's going to go pick it up in a couple hours. It's not being delivered, but she's getting, you know, curbside delivery. So concierge are another way. All right. Can anybody think of anything else? Did we miss anything? Remember small properties. Oh, pet, pet fees. So pet fees. Yep. You can, you can include pet fees. Uh, you can include a pet rent a one-time fee, a deposit and a rent just depends on whether the market can support it or not. Okay. Good. Perfect. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Richard. Okay. All right. So that's income. That's how we can increase income. How can we create operating efficiencies? Well, management is the first. So let's talk about that. Property management. Are you using the existing management company or are you going to fire them and hire another management company or are you going to self-manage in the short term? And the reason I say short term is because you do not want to be managing this long term because once you identify that you can do one of these and you start the process, you're going to get addicted really fast and you're going to want to go get more. And I would highly recommend you go get more, especially as we enter this down market. There are going to be some that are available. Go get them before anybody else does, okay? So existing, do we keep the existing management? Look over the financials that you have access to. Uh, you can request bank statements if there aren't any real financials to be given so that you can see what's being spent on the property. If the owner will give it to you, and it's your risk one way or the other, whether you accept that he doesn't or does. I actually like getting bank statements so I can verify two things. Are the expenses accurate on the P&L? And is the income that's being reported accurate from the P&L? And we can look at that through the bank statements, right? You can also request um, when you're verifying the income is if they have uh, receipts, so a lot of self-managed or off-site managed property management companies will accept cashier's checks, cash, things like that. Most won't accept cash anymore. Um, they don't like to get paid by credit card. And if they do accept credit card, they end up billing the tenant for the credit card. So if you think about a 3% transaction fee on an $800 rent, what's What's your uh, transaction fee? That's another $24 that you have to pay in rent to cover a credit card so or a debit card. So a lot of people won't pay that way. So they'll bring in a cashier's check or a money order. That's the number one way offsite managers receive rents. Um, sometimes they'll accept personal checks. And they'll have like a big non-sufficient fund fee, like 50 bucks, but you only get one NSF and then they don't ever accept the check from that person again. So if you do accept checks, pay attention to that, okay? So when we look at the financials, we can say, is this management company operating this property correctly? 
if you're getting the opportunity to do a master lease option, chances are they're not. So there can be a huge operational efficiency just by firing them and either hiring somebody you already know or that you've interviewed that you like or self-manage in the short term so that you can find where these efficiencies can happen, where you can increase rents, where you can reduce expenses if you can, and in the same process, hire a management company to take over. That way you get a feel of the property. You learn who all the residents are. You can start to see uh, uh, Susan, I don't know how to do that. Susan asks, can I enable closed captioning? I don't know. Let me see. I've never done that before. Uh, I, I do not see a way to allow it or not. I think you have to do it on your end. All right. So I'm going to keep going. I, I don't have a way. I don't know how to do it, Susan. Sorry. Um, she gets audio issues where it cuts in and out because of where she lives. Um, so if you operate it for yourself, do it on a very, 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 very short-term basis, like just a couple of months, if that's possible. The other thing you may have to manage, uh, self-manage for is when you're negotiating to purchase the uh, to purchase that master lease, to get that master lease in place, if you end up having to negotiate very, very close to existing NOI, then um, then uh, sorry, she's messaging me back. Let me try something here. Um, nope, there's nothing in host controls either, Susan. <clears throat> Sorry, maybe I have it disabled in uh, um, my other settings. Oh, hold on, hold on. I think I found it. Well, one second, guys. I don't know. Are you seeing it now? Do you guys see captioning? No. No, no, no. I hate, I'm sorry about this interruption, but right. I'm trying to make this effective for everybody. Um, hold on. Doggone it. Susan, you're lucky I love you. <laughs> Uh, bum, 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 bum. captions and subtitles there's captions and subtitles i've got it bottom overlaid but apparently it's not working so i don't know if it's because you have to now show it or what um who has their hand raised i do richard go ahead richard what about um collecting rent from companies like rent oops, like rent ready or something of that nature one of those companies they, they uh, typically charge your fees of course they charge fees. They're not going to do it for free. Are they large fees or? I don't know. I never used one. Okay. We collected rents ourselves Yeah. Um, when I owned my property management company. When you hire a property management company, then you can um, request that kind of information. There's still, whether they accept credit card or not, like I, I had Rent Manager and Rent Manager has an online process where you get a an owner's page and the resident could log in to that page to pay their rent. But then I had to either eat that management fee or not management fee. I had to eat that transaction fee or bill it back to the resident. So it doesn't matter who is accepting online payments, um, you're going to have that fee. It's easier if they will accept um, bank uh, bank to bank transfer. Like if you can set your checking account up for transfer to your rent, because then the cost is only one dollar. At least through rent things like uh, Zelle and whatnot. You know, there's there's two or three platforms out there that don't cost anything. I think most people have something they can use these days. 
Uh, what doesn't cost anything, Roger? I must like like Zelle. A lot of banks uh, are plugged into Zelle, and you can simply uh, uh, send your money by using somebody's email or phone number, and you can send. Yeah, but it, if if it's if it's for personal reasons, it doesn't cost anything. If it's for business reasons, it does. That's very interesting. And somebody is getting charged, whether it's the person sending the money or receiving the money, somebody is getting charged. Interesting. But for personal reasons, you're right. If it's like PayPal, you can send money through PayPal. Right. And if it's a gift or personal or something like that, there's no charge to it. But when I pay my VAs through PayPal, they actually have to eat a transaction fee. Roger, sell me some money. I'll let you know if there's a fee. <laughs> uh, well, so Tammy says that she uses Zelle for her business accounts and there is no fee at Chase Bank. So interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. I didn't know that. Everything I've seen for business has been a transaction fee. See, I learned things too. That's why I ask questions about what else do you guys see that we missed, okay? So management is probably the biggest way to increase efficiencies, how we operate the cost of operating the property from the management perspective, all right? We can control that initially by doing it ourselves, but be careful. You could price yourself right out of the market um, if you don't know what you're doing. So if you do, keep it very short-term, work towards hiring that property manager. The other way, if we get technology to work here, is preventative maintenance. Right? We already talked about lowering expenses through a rubs program or um, some kind of just uh, billing back for flat fee. So that will, even though it's considered other income, technically your expense is still the same for the uh, utility, but you've got income coming in to subsidize it. So that's why you won't see uh, utilities here as a way to lower the cost. There are other ways like contracts. So if you do have a laundry room, one of the most onerous contracts in property management is the contract with the laundry room provider that's providing the machines, the maintenance, everything else. CoinMac was the biggest. And CoinMac had a ironclad contract that if you sold the property, that their contract would transfer with the sale of the property, which you would think would make it illegal because you've got a new owner coming in. Um, so that new owner did not agree to that contract. The old owner did. But the way it's written in the agreement, if you don't do your due diligence correctly, when you look at your vendor contracts, is it's written in a clause in their contract that says that if the property trades hands, the new owner is agreeing to keep this contract in full force and effect. Uh-oh, didn't see that clause. I wasn't paying attention to that. Okay, and CoinMax expensive. They're not cheap, but they are the best. You pay for what you get. Maybe they're not today. I mean, this was five, six years ago. When I own my, well, crap, almost seven years ago now when I own my management company. So pay attention to stuff like that. So you can reduce expenses through vendors. Um, your trash, uh, if you have dumpsters, can you get a better contract through a different dumpster company? Your laundry provider, um, your landscaper, things like that. So who you pay third party for, your vendors to come service your property you can find efficiencies there. That's on the uh, expense side, but that's about the only controllable expenses we have. The rest are pretty much fixed. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about preventative maintenance because this is the easiest way to minimize what you will spend in unexpected maintenance costs and minimize deferred maintenance. So with preventative maintenance, we're consistently looking at plumbing, HVAC, and fire and safety, all right? Those are the three big things we look at. While you're looking at plumbing, you can also be looking at your subpanels, electric. It's hard to look at electric because most of it is in the walls and it's internal, and you really can't see what's going on with electric. 
where we can with plumbing because we have external components like uh, underneath sinks and in the mechanical closet with the water heaters and things like that. So we can physically see what's going on with that. Same with HVAC. HVAC, other than the ducting, most of the com components are external. And then fire and safety is all of your fire extinguishers, your uh, carbon uh, monoxide um, detectors, if you have gas, and your smoke detectors, as well as stairs, banisters, things like that, trip hazards, that's fire and safety, okay? Then we have amenities, laundry, parking, office. We can have preventative maintenance for each of these as well, especially for laundry. Parking, making sure that your stripes are clear and painted, that the parking lot is in good condition, doesn't have potholes damaging cars, okay? Uh, your office, making sure it's clean, uh, that it's maintenance-free, things like that. And we'll talk about uh, timing on all these in a minute. And then, of course, keeping stuff clean, the parking, common areas, office. You know, we can't keep inside the units clean. That's up to the residents unless you have a cleaning concierge service like they do in hotels, all right? So um, I don't know very many operators that offer a cleaning concierge service. It's a thought. David? Yes, sir. Do you have any experience with the blacktop parking lots? Um where they resurface it, you know, with a with like almost like a tar or paint, or never do that because it tends to peel. I we don't do it in the south because of the heat and the humidity, tear it right up. Uh, we do resurface parking lots all the time here, and so when you're resurfacing asphalt, asphalt typically is a four inch thickness. And you can resurface the top one or two inches, uh, and that will eliminate most potholes. Uh, and then they restripe by painting and, and put in the curb stops. Um, resurfacing is much more affordable than completely digging up all the asphalt and relaying the whole thing. Um, on our 60 unit in 2015, 15, 16, 16, 17, 2017. In 2017, so think of inflation, um, it cost us $35,000 for, we had 93 parking spaces. For a parking lot for 60 units, 93 parking spaces. It cost us $35,000 to resurface, restripe, and put in new parking stops, okay? So that'll give you an idea of what that would cost. Now, why would we do that? Can we get more rent because we have a black painted parking lot? You, you know what, David, it's uh, it's curb appeal. It's a presentation of your building. You got it, brother. That's exactly what I was looking for, Mr. Roger. You hit the nail on the head. If you're driving to a property, that you've made an appointment with to come look at as a resident. And the first thing you see is this gray, dingy, pothole filled, no lined parking lot. You're just going to keep right on driving. Okay. Curb appeal. So yes, it, there is a cost benefit to doing it. All right. So preventative maintenance schedule. We talked about what items we do for preventative maintenance. Let's talk about the schedule. So for cleaning, you're going to do it daily. Clean the parking lot daily, clean the office daily, clean the common areas daily. You'd be surprised how many residents that like to have a little side income so you could pay them 20 bucks a day to clean the property, especially young residents, teenagers, young adults that are in between high school and finding a job that are still living with their parents, things like that. Or maybe a stay-at-home uh, housewife or mom or husband or just some guy that's lazy that um, gets disability uh, from an injury or maybe a mental injury or something like that. Not that they're lazy, they just, they can't work. So they get subsidized income and, um, but they want things to do. They want to stay busy. So these are the perfect residents to pay 
I like to pay, well, then again, 2016, 2017, 2018, when I had my management company, I'd pay $20 a day for somebody to clean all these areas. And it just keeps the property looking better. And that way you don't have the cost incurred from your offsite manager coming to the property to clean the property every day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Keeps that curb appeal up. So weekly, we want to do our amenities. So just take a look. If you've got washers and dryers, just go in and inspect them in a, um, in a laundry room. Uh, if you've got um, a dog park for whatever reason on a small property, it'd be rare. But if you had one, you know, make sure that all the poop and stuff is picked up in the dog park, that the fence isn't falling down, that the grass is mowed, stuff like that. Um, those are what we do on a weekly basis. So the fewer the amenities you have, the less you're doing on a weekly basis. Monthly, you want to replace all the HVAC filters. You want to inspect and sign the inspection card on all the fire extinguishers, which are required by OSHA. And you want to check the smoke detectors uh, for dead batteries. That is on a monthly basis. If you have a larger property, so we had a 60 unit. So what we would do was uh, we would divide up the number of units on a daily basis. So basically you have 20 days in a month that you're working. So uh, what we would do is we would take three units a day and there'd be a list for the maintenance guy that would go do those three units every single day for these monthly items. That way, every month, the list was completed, and it was very rare that they had to catch up at the end of the month, all right? And that way, your HVAC systems won't fail because your filters haven't been changed in six months. If you leave it to the residents to change the filters, they're not going to change them, and you're going to have HVAC problems. On a quarterly basis, now we're doing inspections, so we want to inspect uh, all of our um, water heaters, make sure they're not leaking, um, update any of the information from the data plate, take a look at the age of that water heater, keeping in mind that water heaters erode from the inside out, especially in the south, they'll corrode. What will happen is at the very bottom of the water heater, it will corrode along that bottom seam where the bottom seam will eventually split. If you start to see corrosion on that bottom seam, it is time to replace that water heater. It's getting very close to flooding whatever unit it's in. And if it's on the second floor, now you're flooding multiple units, okay? Why do so, they flood more in the south? Why do they uh, rust more? Is it the humidity? Humidity. Okay. Correct. All right, and then you have your stairs and rails. So this is a great time if you have two stories or three stories that you are inspecting your stairs, your banisters, your rails, and all that information or all that stuff to ensure that there's nothing loose, nothing wiggles, because if OSHA comes by and does an inspection and they find issues, then there's extra costs to one, pay the fine that you're going to get fined for, and then have to hire somebody on an emergent basis to be able to get these items fixed which is going to cost more. So it just prevents stuff like that from happening. David, would it be a good idea to ask the residents if they find something to report it right away? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you want that. So if, especially if there's a leak in their apartment, you want them reporting that leak immediately because the longer the leak goes, the worse the problem gets. And especially if they're upstairs, eventually that water, water travels downhill. Did you guys know that? It doesn't travel uphill travels downhill, goes to the least path of resistance. It's like electricity. Electricity, the electrons flow to the least path of resistance and they love grounds. So they're going to go where they until they can find a ground. And once they find a ground, they're there. Okay, water's the same way. Water flows downhill. So if you're upstairs and you have a leak, eventually it's going to end up in that downstairs unit. Semi-annually, you want to do HVAC servicing. I would do this on a seasonal basis, do that six, six month, six month. So for the Northeast, you guys have pretty close to six month uh, hot, cold seasons. Although it's, you guys actually have cold, warm, hot, warm, cold. 
In the South, it's either just hot or it's cold. We, we very rarely get warm. But I like to pick April and October as my months for servicing the HVAC units. So you service, you, what you're, all you're really doing is checking the Freon. And the way they can check it when they're doing the inspections quarterly, if they have a temperature gun, you go to the um, registers and you just shoot the intake register and see what the temperature is at the intake register. That should be ambient temperature in the room. And then you shoot the out register, which will give you a colder temperature. That temperature differential should be around 15 degrees or greater because most HVAC units are efficient to about 15 degrees cooling. So if it's 90 degrees outside, you can get inside your unit, even though your thermostat is set on 68, the best you're gonna do is probably around 75 degrees, okay? That's how they operate. So on a quarterly basis, they can shoot those registers and those guns are pretty cheap. You can get them for about 50 or 60 bucks. Make sure your maintenance guy has one and just shoot those registers every quarter when they're doing the quarterly inspections. And then every six months, actually check the servicing on the compressors. That's the Freon servicing. Annually, you have to hydrostatic test all your fire extinguishers. So they got to be inspected monthly. And then they have to be weighed, which is a hydrostatic test, uh, every um, 12 months. That You'll find a lot of the fire departments will have access to vendors that can provide these for you at a fairly good rate because they want them done. If you don't do it and OSHA visits the property or a property inspector in visit, visits the property and they see you're not doing it, now you're getting fined. All right. And they can, um, they can, depending on your market, green card, red card, yellow card, whatever that unit, deeming that unit uninhabitable until that fire extinguisher is tested appropriately. Now you got to move your tenant to a hotel until that's done. You don't want to deal with those headaches. Okay. Of course, this is not what the gurus tell you happens. You have to learn it yourself. Any questions on finding operation efficiencies through preventative maintenance, which really just limits the amount of additional maintenance you'll have to do. All right, good. So now we've operated the property for three years, or maybe we operated it for one year. And in that one year time, we've said, "Woo, this is more than we thought it was going to be. I thought I wanted to be an active player in the multifamily industry and operate these properties, but this sucks. I don't want to do this no more. And you get out of the master lease and then you become a passive investor. Um, or you go the three years or five years, whatever your business plan had planned for. You loved what you were doing. You had a great property management company. You guys were able to put in efficiencies. The, op, the property is just operating like a property should. The residents are happy. They love living there. It's a beautiful place. And you've really improved that place. Okay. So either situation, it's time to exit the master lease. Excuse me. So how do we do that? Well, first is... Um, you exercise the option to purchase. So that is a way to exit the master lease is if you're buying the property, you're exercising that option to purchase. We're going to go ahead and purchase the property that gets you out of the master lease, but you want to make sure that you give the owner 60 days notice. Even if your lease says 30 days notice, give them 60 days notice. Okay. That's courtesy. You're going over and beyond what you should do. You should plan everything for 60 days. Primarily because a lot of Tech vendors like CoStar, they have written in their contract 60-day notice, and you don't want to miss that 60-day notice if you've been in a year-long contract. Call them on day 59, you just wrote yourself in for another 12 months. So make sure, just, just be um, diligent about it and just give them 60 days notice. That way they know what's going on. We can start planning and preparing. Uh, if you are exercising the option to purchase, 
and you're looking for taking over the loan or negotiating with their lender to get that loan, then you're probably letting the owner know at the six month mark, because you'll find out here in a minute that we're going to start talking to that lender six months out. Uh, so we have time to get them everything they need at the time we're ready to close this deal. Uh, so you want to let the owner know before you reach out to the lender. Don't ever reach out to the lender without letting the owner know. Okay. So that can be that notice at that time. Or you can assign the master lease. Remember, we talked about in the master class, when I did the master class before we did this workshop, that this master lease has value. And you can assign it just like you could if you had a property under contract to purchase. You can assign the master lease to somebody else to take over the master lease. If you do that, make sure you get the owner's approval. There are, remember we said when we started this that you can do this one of two ways. You can get a master lease with owner approval or without owner approval. Without over owner approval makes it one-sided your way and it can create waves in the future and create discord and um, conflict. I don't like any of that. I think, as I've mentioned multiple times, we should always work towards a win-win. And we should always seek the owner's approval until we own the asset. So I always like to use owner approvals on anything we do. The only exception to that is when we're bringing in new residents, we don't need owner approval for that. We do that on our own, okay? So if we're gonna assign the master lease, we need owner approval. Um, and then it's just a matter of finding somebody willing to take it. And um, whatever fee you're looking for, whether you're looking for a fee or not is up to you. You could just assign it to them without that fee. Um, especially if it's been a really bad situation for you and you just want out of it uh, and they want in it, let them have it, or you can negotiate a fee. Either way, make sure you get the owner's approval for that assignee. Or you just lease, just exit it at expiration. And if you do that, make sure you give 60 days notice to the owner, okay? You don't have to give 60 day notice, 60 days notice to the owner for assigning the master lease because that master lease is going to continue so the only thing that affects the owner on that is approving the new assignee or not. Otherwise, it just keeps going right on going. Any questions on exiting the master lease? That's really the three ways you do it. Hearing none, let's keep moving. So now let's exit the option to purchase. So let's say we're not going to purchase the property. So we're going to exit our option to purchase, which we can do at any time. Now, if we're under a master lease, we can exit the option to purchase, but we're still obligated to master lease the property until that master lease expires. So this will typically be done at the expiration of a master lease. So we can have them sign the release of option agreement, and that's been provided to you guys in the members area. Again. If you're not going to exercise the option, give the owner 60-day notice to let them know because the owner may want to interview your management company that you have to see if they're going to keep them or not. Or maybe they got to hire somebody new or, 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 or there's a bunch of different ors here, okay? So give them 60 days notice so you can start preparing for that transition. Or again, you can assign the option agreement. So if you assign the master lease, you're also going to want to assign the option agreement. Now, especially if you put option consideration down, money down, you are going to want to negotiate some kind of fee for assigning the option agreement to somebody else. Again, that amount is going to depend on the agreement itself and what the current NOI is on the pro property. And this is no different than wholesaling a property you have under contract. Technically, you do have this property under contract. 
You just have a three-year or five-year or whatever you negotiated period in order to close on that contract, okay? So that's, you're just wholesaling this contract is what you're doing at this point. Again, make sure you get the owner approval of the assignee that takes over that new contract, All right? That's if we don't purchase the property. But what if we do want to purchase the property? Something we didn't talk about early on, but I've mentioned this in the masterclass, escrow some cash flow so when you get to the point where you do want to purchase this property you have some funds put away so that if you do end up getting um, the lender to agree to sell to you uh, and you don't get the owner to agree to do seller financing your down payment's covered and the property paid for it it doesn't come out of your pocket Okay, this is a no money down situation for you if you do this right. So as soon as you possibly can, you may not be able to in the very, very, very beginning of starting your master lease, but as soon as you can start doing it, you want to start escrowing funds in a separate savings account that you are going to use when it's time to exit. Make sure it's an interest bearing account. Now, when exit comes, if you decide not to purchase the property, just consider it a savings account, okay? Now you have some walkaway money, all right? But if you do purchase the property, you've got some backup funds that can help you in negotiation, all right? You're not at a disadvantage if you don't have funds when it comes time to negotiate getting out or buying this project, either from the lender or with the owner, if you're trying to get them to sell or finance, which we'll talk about in a minute. Start this process about six months out. So let the owner know, hey, about six months from now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to exercise our option to purchase. Okay. Let them know you're going to be reaching out to the lender so that you could start communicating with the lender. All right. And now the owner knows they need to start preparing on their end for the sale as well. So you're both prepared going into this. Get your T12. You've been operating the property. You know you need a T12 to make lenders happy. You don't have to have it, but it makes them happy. And the happier they are, the happier you'll be. So make sure that your management company is keeping up with a T12, keeping current rent rolls up, and you're keeping a list of all the capital expenses that you've done over the last two, three, four, five years, however long you've been operating this, as you get ready to exit, because the lender is going to want to know all of this information. Update your business plan. Now, your first business plan you put together covered for you for this first three years. I'm just going to say three years could be whatever you guys decide to go for term. I'm just going to call it three years. So up to this point, you had a business plan. Now, update this business plan for your next however long you decide to hold. If you can get this thing and own it yourself, maybe this is a long-term play for you. Maybe it's 20 years, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 24 months because you wanna flip it because you have something you need to pay for whatever reason and you need a big payday. Whatever that reason is, update that business plan, okay? So we're going to put a summary together it's no different than your pitch deck or your offering summary that you put together for investors that we've all learned how to do and use. And we've all used in the past if you've raised capital, including myself. Make it similar to that, but your investor is your lender. It's not other investors. We're not actually raising capital from other investors. Unless you didn't escrow money and you don't have money to put down on the property, if that's the case, maybe you go do something else. I don't know why you're in the multifamily business. Usually most people are in this business to build wealth. Um, if you're not saving, if you're not building that wealth, I'm not sure why you're here. Uh, so maybe question yourself as to why you're trying to purchase this property. But nevertheless, if you don't have that money and you didn't escrow, um, you're going to need to raise money, whether it be through a JV partner, a co-sponsor, or 
investors, you're going to need to raise that money for that, whatever down payment you're going to need to purchase this thing with. So um, having that offering summary will help. It doesn't have to be for just the lender, but if you've done things right, it should be for just the lender. And then of course, update your pro forma for how, however long, excuse me, you plan to hold the property for. Now, if you're going to do a 30-year hold, 20-year hold, 10-year hold, I wouldn't do a 10-year pro forma. Just do a five-year, let the lender know, look, we all know that there's no way none of us can predict beyond this. We just want to give you this so you can see what it's going to be five years from now to make you comfortable. And they'll be like, perfect. Glad you thought about us. And then something a lot of people forget about is the pictures you took when you bought this thing, um, the condition it was in, the negotiations that you had with the owner. The financials that you received from the owner, keep all of that, store it away so that when you get ready to purchase this thing and you're going to get a loan from a lender, you have before and after. You can show the lender, look, this is how I took this property over. Here's what it looks like today. Chances are the lenders probably visited the property and knows, but just in case they haven't, make sure you have that information available. It lets them know that you've done uh, the job that needed to be done to keep it where it is today and that you've been responsible for the last three years. Okay, Deshaun. Thanks, buddy. We're almost done. Anyway, you're not missing much. All right. So purchasing the property continued. Now that we've reached out to the lender and we've got the lender working towards their term sheet, we got to get a property insurance binder. So we've got to negotiate with property insurance companies because now we need to have the property insurance because we're purchasing the property. Right now, the owner has property insurance. So we've got to either negotiate with that vendor or go find our own for property insurance. When we did our due diligence on this, initially, we didn't need a survey. Now we do. We're going to own this thing. We're going to want our own survey. So you're going to hire an engineering firm to do a survey. There are two types. There's either an Alta survey or a boundary survey. A boundary survey is just that. It is just going to draw the boundary where the markers are so that you can see where your property is located. They may draw the buildings on there, but that's about it. Just the outline of the buildings. That's all they're going to do. In an Alta survey, it actually runs with the title insurance so that any uh, easements, encroachments, um, trees, uh, fences, power poles, uh, anything that is on that property will be included in this survey, okay? Any water running through it, uh, it won't have a topography, but it'll have all the rest of that stuff. And it's a much more valuable survey. Now it costs more to get it, but just consider it part of your closing costs, but you're gonna want to get that all to survey. Um, I do know people that get boundary surveys. You're going to want Alta. I don't know what Alta stands for, um, Susan. You'll have to talk to the engineering firms, but that's just the term it's called is Alta survey. That way it includes all the encroachments, easements, encumbrances, all of that. You're going to need to bring on a title company or escrow attorney, whatever state you're in. Um, so that you can start the closing process. The first thing we need to do is let them know we need a title binder. That way you can see what, uh, what may be on the title report. You're looking for the exceptions. So it's usually the Schedule B that will have the exceptions. What that means is we're going to underwrite this as it sits for title insurance, except for these items. And these will be items like a vendor lien, uh, property taxes not paid, um, different things like that. Maybe there's an easement coming through the property. Now, the uh, property or the title insurance company isn't going to write it for that easement, but they're going to, it's going to let you know that there's an easement through it. Now, you want to compare that easement with your Alta survey and make sure that it's accurate. All right. That's why the two run together so that. Uh, that title binder will let you know what has to be cured before you can get title insurance on the property, or at least what the title insurance company is going to be responsible for. 
before you close on the property that you get that title insurance for. And if you have a lender, you're going to be required to get title insurance. Well, you're going to be required to get lenders title insurance, not necessarily owners, um, but you're going to want both. Trust me, you're going to want both. They'll also start preparing all your clo closing documents and all the lender documents. All right. So before we get into seller financing, let's pull up my due diligence checklist. So if we come all the way down to prior to closing, okay, we can see that we got our loan commitment. We've already started working on that with the lender, our insurance binder, our title insurance or insurance title insurance binder. If we're putting together an LLC, our LLC documents are filed. If we're putting together a syndication, our SEC documents are filed. All escrow funds are wired. We got a closing statement, that HUD from the title company. Assignment of leases have been created. And then a final walkthrough. Now, you're not going to need to do a final walkthrough because you've been operating this property for the last three plus years. Okay, So these are all the things we're looking for prior to. Um, other things you're going to look at is... When we talk about management company up here, we're looking for bank accounts uh, and really bank accounts. So that's another thing we got to start working towards. You probably already have those bank accounts in place. So you're not going to have to worry about that. It's probably already there. At least if you did it right when you acquired the master lease, it's going to be already there. Um you already have access to all the leases and tenant files and keys, so you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about tenant prorated rents and deposits because you've already got access to all that. You want to make sure that that deed gets recorded. Your bank account should already be opened. Management turnover is going to become a big deal. Utilities transferred. Remember, the utilities are in the owner's name. So you're going to want to get them transferred into your name. And of course, we talked about vendor contracts. All right. And then if that state requires or that community requires a business license, you'll need to get a business license updated. There's some other things on here, but you I don't think you guys can disagree that this is going to be one of the most complete due diligence checklists you've ever seen. And I've been giving this away lately. So you guys all have access to this. All right. So. But we don't want a lender. Lenders are expensive today. We're trying to save a little bit of money. We're in this business to make money. Yes, we definitely want to build a community and we've built a community over the last three years. Our tenants love us. They love the community. They love the property. The property's clean, looks great. We got people banging down our doors to try to get units for this place, okay? Just means our rents are too low. So we're going to try to get seller financing. So the goal, obviously, is 100% of the purchase price. Whatever that price was that we negotiated three years ago, that's a, that's the number. We want the owner to owner finance 100% of that, okay? Um, what you've got to be careful of here is the loan. So if you're, uh, if you've got a lender, then that loan amount has got to be paid off, all right? Unless you're, for whatever reason, assuming that, like we talked about before. So it caught my eye when I built this. I didn't think about it. 100% of the purchase price um, may not be feasible depending on what that loan amount is, okay? We're not trying to do a subject two here. That's not what we're doing unless the lender agrees that you can do a subject to. Probably not going to do it though. They're not going to let you transfer title without putting you on that loan, all right? It, they just don't, but they may. I'm not saying they're not going to. So really, if there's a lot left on the loan and it's not feasible for the owner to do 100% financing, and where we can go back to this is remember that we tapped into, or we have been escrowing funds. If we have enough funds that we can pay the loan off 
and have the owner uh have the owner um whoo, brain farted there for a second uh loan the rest in owner financing that could be a way to do that all right uh again just depends on how much loan is on the property whether you can do this or not if they own it free and clear whoo bonus get them to 100% of the purchase price otherwise you're either going to need another lender and have the owner uh owner finance whatever is left after that loan is paid off um if the lender that you get allows you to do that some do some don't so you have to make sure that they're allowed a second position all right so again if the lender won't do 100% of whatever funds are left over that you need then you can tap into those escrowed funds that's why we're putting them in there the whole key to this is try to do this with no money out of pocket all right and you can do that but these are the different traps you run into when you're doing this now you'll hear a bunch of people tell you this is a great no money down strategy but they only tell you the very 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 basics and they don't dig deep into the rest of everything else and you get to the end of this thing and then you realize holy crap i got to put 30 percent down to take this thing over nobody told me that i don't have the money now what am i going to do now i got to either go raise capital get joint venture partners whatever so escrow those funds just in case so you have them so let's assume one way or the other whether we have our lender involved and are we're trying to sell or finance the remaining uh of whatever that sale price was so if we're purchasing it for let's just call it a million five and there's um a million uh, a million left in debt we need 500,000 so our goal here would be to get the owner to finance that $500,000 okay that that would be the goal in this case um you could if you're getting new if you're getting new financing through the same lender because you've been operating this property based on what the value is today then you could get a loan that will uh pay for 100 of the purchase price so if you've increased the value enough where at a 75 or a 70 percent loan to value you're completely paying the old loan off and the owner off um and the lender lets you do that and there are some that would again you've created a no money down situation for yourself okay so it's it's a it's almost working out like a cash out refi if you will even though it's not a refi it is a uh it's a loan they're giving it to you at 70 or 75 percent of current value the money gets escrowed and as money gets distributed the additional distribution on top of what the loan gets paid off gets paid to the owner all right I wouldn't try to collect any money yourself on that. You could try. There are some people that do try. I think you're pushing your luck doing that. Um, it's bonus if the lender even lets you do it, which we've seen in the past. Whether they do it this cycle or not, I don't know. You have to test it, okay? But these are the ways that we try to do this so that we can have this no money down situation. Does all that make sense? Did I confuse anybody by saying any of that? not confusing however um can you explain maybe an instance when that has happened and what type of loan and lender that might be well again master lease options haven't been done in a long time but this was an easy strategy from about 2010 to about 2013. during that time frame when these were being done um lenders were uh doing loans at loan to value so if the value because you've risen the noi up to a certain point allowed you to get a 75 percent or a 75 percent loan to value and that loan to value allowed you to completely pay off the old loan and the owner then it got you into a zero money down situation you may had to pay uh um you know your loan fee and your loan costs and closing costs and everything else but again we've escrowed funds so we don't have to tap into that if you don't escrow those funds you're going to have some money out of pocket does, does that answer your question tammy 
Yes, it does, because I was kind of calculating um, estimated, like say on a 24 unit, what your annual profit might be over three years, and it's just nowhere near enough for a 20 or 30% down payment, even if you saved all of it. And so it's like you're working for three years just to save all that, and you still don't have enough to get a, a traditional loan. Give me an example. Show me, give me your numbers. Okay, um, so if you have uh, 150 a unit for 24 units, you're looking at 3.6 times 30% is a million. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what, what do you mean 150 a unit? If you're paying 150 a unit for 24 What in the units, hell would you be paying 150 a unit for? Okay, well, so where are you looking? They're over almost 300 a unit in Reno right now. Yeah, you're, you're not looking for those type of properties though. You're looking for the type of properties based on, remember when we talked about it in the very beginning, I wouldn't look at it on a price per unit basis. We know interest rate today, well, it went down uh, Friday, but before Friday, Thursday, interest rates were right at 6%. If you were a good borrower, you could get 6% um, on a loan. So that meant if you take 1% and add 1% to that, your cap rate should be 7% on existing financials. So whatever that property is in Reno, let's say the rents were 1500 a month. I don't know if they are or not in Reno. I haven't done Reno's or did I do? I did, I did Sacramento and Tahoe. I haven't done Reno. Um, I don't know what the, the rents are in Reno, but let's say they're 1500 a month. You've got 20 units with 5% uh, vacancy. Whatever that brings us to, um, and then minus our operating expenses to get to that NOI that is current for that property, and it's going to be lower than most properties because this owner's in trouble or this owner just doesn't want to do this anymore. More than likely, they're not at what market rent is. I'm just trying to give an example. But that's what we're purchasing the property at is based on that value on that day. Okay. In no way, shape, or form am I telling you to pay market rate for these properties. Um, what you're seeing them bought at today is being bought on pro forma. We don't buy on pro forma, we buy on existing. So you're you're typically getting, well, I know things have changed a lot, but and Reno's different than a lot of other areas, but you're probably looking at about, even in Reno, 70 to 80,000 a door. Okay. Depending on what the rents are, it depends on what the current rents are. Does that make sense? Yes, I, it's going to be quite the hunt. Of course. Yeah, of course it is. But there's always going to be opportunities. There are going to be people that have not been able to perform on these properties. Either they overestimated it, they didn't know what they were doing, they thought they could do it, whatever the case is, or they've owned it for 40 years. They just don't want it anymore. Their kids don't want it. So they're ready to get out of this thing, but they don't know what to do. Or they don't want to go through the sale process because they don't want to be bothered with all this stuff, but they would love it if somebody would master lease all those units. That would work for them. And then even bonus if we can get that uh, option agreement. So I know it doesn't make sense right at this moment because we still see a potential hot market. It hasn't shown signs of a lot of cooling yet, but we're talking about six to 12 to 18 months from now. We're not, we're starting the process today, but we know there's not gonna be a whole lot of opportunity today. But as, as these, uh, as the market continues to go down, more and more opportunity is going to come up. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. However, I think you mentioned that we are probably not going to be able to do something like this on anything that's been purchased on pro forma, basically, in the last few years, because their loan amounts are just going to be too high. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And if Reno has been like everywhere else, only 18% of those properties have been sold on those uh, on that type of uh, on that type of transaction. Okay. If it's like everywhere else, a big if. 
not knowing the Reno market. They haven't looked at it yet. Okay. Thank don't you. Just, don't get discouraged by what's going on right now. Okay. Got it. <laughs> this works in a down market. This does not work in a hot market. That's why I haven't taught it yet. But we're getting to a point where this is going to become applicable. Any other questions on this before I move to the next part of it? All right. So obviously, whether we're getting 100% financed or whether we're getting 100% of the remaining financed, we want to get our interest rate below that market rate. So it's just a matter of negotiating with that owner. If you have to get it at market rate, you get it at market rate. Um, but we always try to get it below market rate. These, these are the goals. Obviously, we want interest only. You don't have to deal with an amortization schedule. Just let the owner know it's interest only. And your term should be five to 10 plus years, whatever the strategy is for you. I don't know what your goals are. You have your own goals. For me, I'm going 20, 30 years. I'm never selling anything. I, I, if I ever go out and buy an apartment on an active basis again without being passive, I'm never selling. And I'm going to be doing it on my own as my own owner or partnering with very close friends or family that want to do it with me that I know the relationship isn't going to get ruined because of it. So um, that's my strategy. Everybody's strategy is different. So based on your goals will be the term that you negotiate for this. And then, of course, when that term ends, you have to balloon the owner the amount that they financed for you. Okay. So as we've said before, one of the ways to get them to want to do this, and one of the reasons why I said in the very beginning, yeah, we'd love to have just the loan amount as our lease, and we definitely don't want to go over NOI, but the sweet spot somewhere in between. And the reason the sweet spot somewhere in between is because we have to pay the owner every month and the owner has to pay the lender every month. So if the lender, if the owner's keeping a little bit of that and doesn't have to send it all to the lender, then they're receiving cash flow on a passive basis and they get used to that over the last three years. Now they're getting ready to lose that. So by offering seller financing for whatever you're trying to get, whether it's 100% of what's remaining or 100% of the deal if they don't own any debt, then, um, but chances are, I mean, if we're paying the loan amount that there's going to be some debt left, then they're getting that cash flow. And that is a big, big opportunity for you to tap into that. Do you really want to lose that cash flow you've been getting for the last three years? In addition to that, these are called installment sales. When you have seller financing, that's an installment sale. And if you're paying the owner in installments, that means that their capital gain is greatly affected on the positive side for the owner because they're not receiving all that money up front. Because of that, they don't have to pay that capital gain tax. So I'm not saying they don't have to pay any capital gain tax. Nice. Depends on the situation, depends on where they are, depends on their own tax situation, how much is involved here. All those require uh, analysts uh, analyzing prior to making that kind of assumption. But let's just say that that capital gain is greatly reduced and spread out over a period of time rather than paying it right up front, right? Does that all that make sense? Yeah, David. Yes. If it's an older person and they're taking that um, to reduce the capital gain, once they pass, don't their owners, don't their heirs get that at the stepped up value at that point in time and they have no capital gains on that? Correct. Yeah, so that that's is, a good negotiation with somebody who's an older, older that person. That is correct. Yep. You know, unless Biden gets what he wants through his tax plan, but that's neither here nor there. David. Yes, ma'am. You are talking about access 
exit strategy, right? So this seller financing is about how we purchase the property. Is that correct? Correct. So are you recommending when we want to exit, we use seller financing? Is that like we just put ourselves in the owner position? So is that the best way to sell the property? Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't understand your question. I, I'm understanding that like, you are talking about exit strategy and this side of financing you are- yeah, but this, this is a tax strategy for the owner, not for us. But that's for us when we're buying the property, right? We can persuade the owner to sell us with side of financing, right? Correct. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's not like, we sell the property we own. Correct. The, 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 the buyer. We are the buyer in this case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, correct. Any other questions? Well, now you own a property as a single owner with no money out of your pocket and no partners or investors to split cash flow with. So we saw that in the masterclass. How cool is that? Not a lot of people get to do that much lately. So homework. You should have put your marketing plan or have your marketing plan in work to be completed. I've given you all the tools for it. You can't say I haven't done that for you. So you've got everything you need to get that marketing plan completed. So it's time to start executing that marketing plan. Underwrite deals as if you're buying it today. So back to module five in the strategic partnering workshop for underwriting deals. Take a look at that to fill any gaps you have in about underwriting. Negotiate with owners for a win-win. We talked about that in the previous lesson. Um, and negotiations is also uh, module seven, I believe. Get your agreements approved by an attorney, okay? I've given you examples. Get those agreements approved by an attorney. And then build relationships in your local market or markets. And that is in module three if you need to go back and remember how to do that. So these are your influencers, your title companies, your CPAs, attorneys, uh, appraisers, people like that, all right? Remember, brokers are not who we want to work with on these because it'd be too difficult for the brokers to get paid. So we don't want brokers involved in this process. So now go out, find one deal a quarter for the next three years, and you can be the single owner of hundreds of units, growing your net worth and wealth well beyond any, synd any syndication sponsor in this same time frame. And that is not fluff. That is true. So if you can find in markets that are uh, going down, if you can find these opportunities and you enjoy doing master lease option, and it won't take you many, you'll start transitioning to purchasing straight up rather than doing these. But you may like doing these because you're not really pulling anything out of your pocket doing them. Do, do one every quarter and um, run those for three years. And, and by the end of all this, so let's say six years from now, you've got hundreds of units as a single owner. You are doing really, really, really well at that point. 